You may not think of the Great Salt Lake as a fine dining destination, but it's just that for nearly 10 million birds a year. What keeps them coming back? Mm-mm, brine shrimp. The salt-loving crustaceans that also fuel a multi-million dollar industry. I feel like I have one of the greatest offices in the world. I'm a wildlife biologist with the Great Salt Lake Ecosystem Program for the Division of Wildlife Resources for the state of Utah. This is where we are once a week out on the lake trying to collect different samples uh, in some capacity, whether it's doing brine shrimp samples like this today or doing bird surveys in the spring and the fall. The Great Salt Lake Ecosystem Program was developed in the mid-90s mostly to regulate the commercial harvest of brine shrimp. We now incorporate looking at the migratory birds that use the lake. It's not just one lake for sure. It's five separate bodies of water because we have the north arm, which is at 30% salinity or saturation. That's that pink water. And we have the south arm of Great Salt Lake, which typically sits around 15% on average. Great Salt Lake is one large complex of wetland systems, diked and pounded wetlands, then the outside the dike wetland systems that lead into the freshwater bays of the lake, Farmington Bay, Ogden Bay, Bear River Bay, that then feed into the saltwater bays, Gilbert Bay, and then the hypersaline north arm, Gunnison Bay. Nothing other than millions of species of bacteria and archaea can live in the north arm. And then we have the south arm here, which is home to our brine shrimp and brine flies. Here at Great Salt Lake, we have Artemia franciscana. So it's the same brine shrimp that occur in the Pacific Ocean. The interesting thing about the species of brine shrimp that is on Great Salt Lake is they can give live birth to Nopliae, which are baby shrimp. They can lay eggs, which hatch in one to three days or they can lay cysts, which are eggs, but surrounded by a thick corian shell that helps protect them from drought, getting exposed on the beach, or freezing winter temperatures, and then they can later hatch out. I didn't know about this until I had this job, actually, and I think a lot of people don't realize that there's a multi-million dollar commercial fishery on Great Salt Lake. It happens every year from October to January. So the brine shrimp that are native to Great Salt Lake are unique in that they create a, a cyst, a dormant egg that can survive really harsh conditions. That's their target product uh, because you can process it, dry it out, put it in cans, ship it around the world, and it's used in the aquaculture industry. For some reason that we still don't know, the cysts will float at certain times, certain conditions, they, they'll float. And it produces like an oil slick on the, on the surface of the water. Just like an oil slick, we deploy a, like a spill containment boom. And there's two boats and you're moving very, very slowly because the egg doesn't want to be caught. It wants to go under, it wants to get away from you. So you have to be very, very careful about that. Sometimes the, the boom will take hours, hours to do. When you close the boom and cinch it up so that the egg is thick and it's not going anywhere, then the big boat pulls up and with hydraulic pumps, you pump that into big drainable bags and uh, the water drains out and you're left with the egg. When that boat goes back to the marina, then they, we crane them off onto a, the truck that goes back to the plant. That's usually the way the harvest goes. They're regulated to the point where they're allowed to take the harvestable excess, so we need 21 cis per liter left over in the spring to restart the population of brine shrimp because all the brine shrimp adults usually die over the winter uh, when the water gets too cold. With that regulation of 21 cis per liter, somehow we have to figure out what the cis concentrations are in the lake. So to do that, we do multiple measures of the abiotic factors. I am sending our YSI probe down in the water, throughout the water column, and measuring the dissolved oxygen, pH, and salinity, and temperature. And we 
we'll do that at our shallow sites and deep sites to get a profile. The salinity at the brine layer is 22.2. 22.2. We also do net hauls where we can look at the density and demographics of the brine shrimp in the water column. And we look at the ratio of adults to juveniles, to to cysts. So we've concentrated that cylinder of water down into about 400 mils of water. And that is our data. And that'll give us a density of Males, females, juveniles, not play, which are the baby shrimp, and their cysts. The brine shrimp harvest, where they ship these brine shrimp eggs all over the world in the aquaculture business, is the reason why Great Salt Lake connects us to the world. If you were to buy farmed shrimp at a grocery store, there could be anywhere between a 40 to 50% chance, depending on the year, that you're indirectly eating Great Salt Lake brine shrimp because those shrimp at the store were raised on Great Salt Lake brine shrimp. Uh, we're also tied to the rest of the world through bird migrations, so we get you know, anywhere from four and a half to five million eared grebes that come here. Uh, we get anywhere from 10 to 12 million other migratory birds that migrate through the lake, utilize the food resources, and then move on through uh, Central and South America. I think it's surprising how much life there is in Great Salt Lake. Uh, just the biomass of shrimp and fly larvae in the lake is amazing. And then the sheer number of birds that we see on this lake is amazing too. And I feel super lucky to be able to get out on the lake and see it. Get out on an airboat and see just the hundreds of thousands of different kinds of shorebirds. It's always different and that's why I like coming out here.